I want to take you now to Limpopo, where the health department has raised concerns of the increase of community transmission of the novel coronavirus in and around rural areas within the Mopani district. Health MEC Dr. Popi Ramatuba says Mopani accounts for 87 of the province's confirmed cases and the highest number of active cases within a district at 60. The MEC joins us now on the line. Uh, doctor, thank you very much indeed for coming through. Uh, morning and uh, morning to your viewers out there and thank you for inviting us today. So we're talking about community transmission. I just want to remind the viewers about what we know about these waves that uh, I remember Professor Salim Abdul Karim was speaking about, three waves in South Africa's epidemic. The first wave was when travelers acquiring the disease from other countries and brought it back to South Africa. That's one. The second wave is when the travelers interact with people, work at homes, hospitals, etc. The third wave is what you're concerned about, general community transmission. In other words, the travelers and their contacts will spread the virus in the general community. Now, what are you seeing? Why do you think there's an increase in community transmission in and around the rural areas within Mopani? I think as, as a, a, a province, we, we have noted, you remember that some few, few weeks ago, last month we were concerned about the infection rate around the mining area, which speaks to the interprovincial transmission, yeah. where we even declare it our epicenter, you, you would find that uh, the number of increased cases were within this coconut district, which is predominantly a mining area. But then uh, that was a, a, a cluster out, outbreak, which we've been able to manage it when, when, where we are sitting today, out of those total cumulative 163 cases, only 33 are active cases, and it's not a, a no longer a concern like it was previously. But what we are noticing now with Mopani district, it's, it's a situation where out of the total 87 cases, I, I must indicate that the 72 are active cases, only 15 has recovered. Right. And you, you can't trace them to say uh, all these cases can be linked to this particular area. They are across um, uh, areas, across the municipalities. Yes, while Palavura uh, might be seen to be having the, the highest number. Uh, also started with one a mine worker who traveled from Eastern Cape. Mm. But what we are noticing is that the, 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 when we went to, to look at other cases, they are within the villages where some of the mine workers have tested positive uh, from that, that particular mine, where they are residing. And it, it, the difficulty in this particular area as compared to this Kukune, where we could zoom in in one village. This is a, a situation where you find a mine workers in Palabura are not necessarily residing within uh, that particular municipality. They are also coming from Piani, some of them. So when we try to look at the contacts, and, and tracing the contacts and testing the, the contacts. They are coming from uh, different communities. You look at an area like Marule, which never had a single case. We, we have seen a situation when one, even one of our employees who tested positive uh, coming back to work now has uh, unfortunately uh, infected even the other uh, employees because they, they had a la lunch and, and also even within that area, we can trace to even the community members from that particular area. So that's why we're saying our uh, community outreach uh, approach, yeah. which uh, begins to uh, strengthen the household screening, testing, uh, not only using community health care workers, but this time around getting professional nurses and our general practitioners right. to be involved. It's, it's the one that is also assisting us to pick up uh, the community spread that we are starting to notice. So screening, testing, contact tracing, extremely important in order to bring down the numbers. A lockdown was essentially to, you know, bring down the numbers in terms of reducing community transmission. What's your general sense, MEC? Uh, were people in your province adhering to the lockdown regulations? 
Uh, during the lockdown, I must indicate we, we have seen uh, the benefit of the lockdown. It gave us a breathing space. Um, if you remember, we had screened uh, during that time more than 3.5 million people and only 10 tested positive from our uh, National Health Laboratory Services, despite the fact that we had tested over 4,000. I mean, during that first phase of screening, and that was during the lock level five lockdown. It has indeed assisted, but of course, as the regulations started to be relaxed, when mines started to operate at 50%, that's when we started to see our numbers increasing. We have been able to come up with a strategy. In this province, what we did was to say all the mining areas, We while we started probably at the wrong footing uh, with the mines, but I, I can reassure the public now that we are working closely together with them, uh, assisting each other even with resources. Because our phase two of community-based uh, approach strategy of uh, screening uh, members of the community where the mine workers are residing, either as tenants or either as the resident, where we go in a household and not only screen you for uh, COVID-19, but also looking at a number of comorbidities. Hence, we've brought in nurses who are doing the blood pressure, testing the blood sugar, even cholesterol level. They are also yeah. screening uh, for TB. They are also doing HIV testing. They are also doing malaria testing because you know Limpopo is a malaria endemic area. So, so we have been able to do that and we've been able to pick up certain positive cases through this particular process. And that has been able to, uh, to us to deal with that in. So, so we are saying the continuous uh, 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 screening uh, and testing mm -hmm. will, will continue to assist. But our observation is that our people are not complying to what the president has indicated. President pronounced and advised that we are going to live with this virus. And all what we need to do, government has done all that what government was supposed to do to protect us. But currently, what happens is that we must change our, our lifestyle. We mm -hmm. must change the way we are doing things. We can still go to work every day. We can still go shopping every day. We can continue with our day-to-day -day duties. But what needs to happen is that we must adjust our lifestyle. We've got to tolerate wearing that mask. We've got to make sure that we sanitize our hands and also disinfect the surfaces. Right. If what I advise uh, the people of Limpopo is that if we can treat each and every surface as if it's infected, each and every individual as if they are COVID-19 positive, it's just that you don't know or sometimes yeah. they don't even know. And that's we the... We will be able to, to, yeah. to, to do that. Uh, MC, that's, that's the general advice, I guess. Behave like you have the virus. Why we say that is because you stop spreading it you're using a mask you think you have the virus so you use a mask so you don't want to spread it to the next person the common refrain that we hear from government is that it is now in your hands and to a certain extent it is because i mean this is this is going to be around for a long time it's, it's you know and flattening the curve is not one event it is an ongoing process but the pushback that you will get mec is that there's still infrastructure challenges not only in schools, but generally. You see protests with regards to infrastructure uh, complaints. What's your view in terms of that? I mean, is government, has government done enough in order to sort that out so that we can deal with this pandemic, epidemic in South Africa? Yes, um, I want to agree that indeed we still have a lot of uh, infrastructure challenges, especially uh, in our schools. Uh, and hence, you have seen that the Department of Education did not uh, uh, just say all the classes will, will open and will start our academic activities on, on the same day. You would have noted that these past two weeks, we have been working with the Department of Higher Education, Science, Technology and Innovation. This particular week, the Deputy Minister was even in the, in, in the province and together visiting all these, um, our institutions of our learning, to try to support them, to say, even with the challenge of the current infrastructure that we're having, let's deal with institution by the institution and try to, to bring innovative ideas to say, how do we empower the students and the 
a campus community to can be able to protect themselves from getting infected in, in this virus. And, and the basic issues of hand uh, sanitizing and also uh, the, the, the issue of covering our mouth yeah. and, and social distance, it's, it's key. Yes, we, we are complaining of issues of, of water challenges in most of our areas and even most of our schools. But then my also question is, uh, the very same school, it's within the community. And that particular, that doesn't mean that when Elena is at home, yeah. Elena will be having access to water. Where well, That is why we're saying the alternative of bringing a, a other ways of, of hygiene or strength, and the hand sanitizing, prioritizing the schools without water to make sure you deliver water yeah. tank and, and make sure that they do sanitize it. But also at the same time, if we look at the number of people who are infected, uh, this morning our number has increased to 517 cumulative cases. Right. The, the people who are currently being infected are people who have got access to proper sanitation, from access to uh, clean water, access to that. And, and, and when you try to look into each and every case, trying to analyze who the epidemiologists, you realize that people have not just been practicing the basic of social distancing and and, it, you know, you enter a, a hospital. I, I just want to give an example with health workers who knows that they are vulnerable. They are at very high risk and we don't want them to, to get sick. You enter a hospital and you find them. This other one is coming back to work from the seven days of duty. They hug and smile and and in front of you. And, yeah. and you are asking, by the way, we're, we're the ones who are supposed to be uh, walking the talk. What is the, the problem? So. We, we just want to say, yeah. while government has got serious uh, 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 challenges and responsibility that they need to do to deal with the issues of backlog of infrastructure, which would not happen overnight, issues of water supply would happen overnight. But we are saying, where we can on our own, what is our role to make sure that we stop uh, the spread ourselves? And lastly, yeah. as a province, one of our strategies to say when we do this, community-based uh, outreach approach. We enter a household and try to train our people to begin to prepare themselves for the West. This you are doing it by, you identify the vulnerable within the household to say there will be a time where we might not have enough facilities to can quarantine you yeah. or enough uh, facilities to, to can uh, be able to, to isolate you. So what we do is to teach you on how you can isolate yourself in your own household, how you can quarantine yourself. Yeah. Our African people have been doing this. When a woman gives birth, there would be a rendezvous where she stays in that rendezvous. Mm. She doesn't mix with any because our elderly people were afraid that if you go and visit, you are going to infect the baby whose immune system uh, was very low. We didn't have pediatricians but they were doing that. If some child has got measles, the child gets isolated. Yeah. If an, a man is sick, then there's a runoff where you are put to say, it's known that in this household, there's somebody who's sick yeah. with an infectious disease. So we're just trying to empower our communities so that they own it up. And once we win on that strategy, yeah. we will protect the vulnerables from going around because they will be quarantined, they will not be infected. And then once they have one who is infected at home, they will be able to isolate even in that rural area. Let me see. Well, that's our main focus currently with look, our rural communities. Look, I, I get what you're saying. Messaging, though, is, is key. Half-hearted, uh, confused, fumbling uh, messaging, measures won't work. The virus will beat us. And it's the lessons that the world's governments, governments around the world are learning. You know, it needs to be clear and concise. The priority is to get the community to understand the deleterious effects of COVID-19. Once they understand, they can make better judgments in terms of moving forward. With regards to your testing, um, are you concerned with regards to the backlog that you currently have in the province? We are really uh, concerned in terms of our capacity uh, testing, especially moving forward. But even our community-based uh, outreach approach towards the surge, it's, it's in, it affected badly by the fact that we 
when we identify a person who meets the criteria for testing, especially those who are asymptomatic but could have been contact uh, of a positive person, there is a huge backlog because when you look at our laboratories, they are now prioritizing those who are admitted in the hospital for whatever uh, condition or reason uh, so that we can get to know whether they are positive or not because they will be having other comorbidities. So that is a real uh, challenge and, and a real problem. Hence, we are saying what we are now focusing is to say those whom we think have been in contact and could be vulnerable, <laughs> we now start to train them on how to can be doing self-quarantine mm. so that they should not get infected. And those whom we suspect could be infected but are awaiting for whatever, we train them on how to self-isolate within that household to still uh, pre prevent the spread. Right. So, so that is why the message of saying you must treat each other as if you are positive, all of you, then it will assist because those who are asymptomatic, whom we are not able to do the test on them, they will be able to be, even if they are positive because they are treating, we are treating each other. Yep. You treat me as if I'm positive. You protect yourself from me. I treat you as if you are positive. I protect you from getting infected. That's the only way which currently we can do yep. to make sure that we, we, we reduce the spread. But, but the critical part here is that we don't want those who are vulnerable to get infected because yeah. we will not be able to, to manage uh, the pandemic once we reach that stage. At right. the moment, as a province, we are comfortable. We are able to manage because currently, even those who are infected, if you look at the recovery rate, it's very high because the people that are infected are minimal. And as a province, we are able to deal with such cases. Right. I mean, I fully understand what you're saying in terms of the messaging. We can't equivocate. The message needs to be clear. We need to understand the risks. If I take a risk, I'm not only risking it for myself, but I'm risking it for you, for your child, for your parents, and vice versa. So messaging is extremely uh, key in this regard. Uh, MEC, we thank you very much indeed for coming on. Thank you. All right. That was Limpopo Health MEC, Dr. Popi Ramatuba. They're giving us an update with regards to what's happening in Limpopo.